ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Corbyn. So, thank you for making it um, what must have been a tough day. Uh, we'll crack on with the questions in just a moment, but before we do, I know you want to reflect on the events uh, over the past few days. Last Thursday afternoon, I was on a train back from Sheffield to London, and the reception came and went on the train, so it was a very frustrating journey. And about 15 minutes into the journey, I heard there'd been an incident in Burstall. 30 minutes later, I discovered how bad it was and that Joe Cox had been murdered in front of the library in her constituency doing her job as an MP. And um, ever since then I've been involved in memorial activities and I went straight to Burstall on Friday morning with the Prime Minister and the Speaker of the House to show respect to her and to her community. I think we should all reflect on this, not just the sheer brutality of the way in which she was killed, but to kill a public representative, an elected representative of the people, in that brutal way, is actually an attack on all of us. It's an attack on our society and on our democracy. It's not just about the safety and security of MPs. It's about the way in which we lead our lives. This afternoon, Parliament was recalled um, to pay tribute to Joe, and I led the tributes from the Labour Party and made the points about her life. She worked for anti-slavery campaigns, she worked for Oxfam, she worked in Darfur, she worked in Syria, she worked in Congo, and she worked in Batley and Spen. And a um, wonderful woman. But in her memory, we have to think about the way we do our politics, the way we do our business, and the way in which hate is routinely meted out against the very poorest, the way we treat refugees as a threat and an enemy. And so I just ask for something a bit kinder and a bit more intelligent in the future, in her memory. And it was a very moving day. Every member of the House wore a white rose from Yorkshire. Thank you, Mr Corbyn. I think we should press on, though, with the questions Thank ahead you. of this important referendum. Many sure. young people want to know some answers. And we're going to bring in Lucy Kendrick for the first question. Lucy. Hiya. Um, do you think that the public truly understand why we ha are having the referendum and what they are voting for? I hope they do, but I somewhat doubt it because this is a referendum that's been discussed amongst the political classes for some years, pushed very hard by those who wish to leave the European Union, and then finally got to fruition in the last general election when the Conservatives promised a referendum and when the vote was put in Parliament to have the referendum after the general election, uh, we all supported it. So it went through Parliament without a problem. Do people fully understand all of it? Probably not. Um, I would hope so, but um, people, I hope, will just think quite seriously about it. It's a big decision. If we stay in Europe, there are implications. If we leave Europe, there are massive implications. But it's also a turning point because if we leave I don't think there's any easy road back. Um, if we remain I believe Europe has got to change quite dramatically um, to something much more democratic, much more accountable and share our wealth and improve our living standards and working conditions all across the whole continent. But there are a couple of days to go and uh, on my experience and I've been involved in lots of elections over my life that in the last two or three days when all the politicians have become exhausted with the campaigning, the public finally catch on and get interested in it. So we've got two days of intense interest, I hope. Tomorrow I'm in Manchester hoping to find lots of intense interest. Now, Lucy, you're a boffin. You're an applied data analytics master. Yeah. Do you understand it? Um, it's difficult, it's I difficult. think. Okay, let's, let's move on to a related question from Jade White. Jade. Mr Corbyn, being a socialist, surely you should be opposing the EU, which is undemocratic and a failing institution, but you seem to have forgotten that now that you're a member of the establishment. Well, two points here. One is I'm not a member of the establishment. I'm a member of the Labour Party, I'm the leader of the Labour Party, I'm, and I'm a Labour MP, and my socialist views are totally unchanged. Do I think that we can achieve greater social justice across Europe by working with trade unions and socialist parties across Europe? Yes, otherwise I wouldn't be advocating a Remain vote, but mine is not unconditional on Europe by any means. I'm opposed 
to the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is being negotiated largely in secret between the European Union and the US because it would import the worst working conditions and standards from the US into Europe. I'm also opposed to the way in which um, Europe shields tax havens, this country as well shields tax havens, and the way in which systematically uh, big companies are exploiting loopholes in employment law. So I'm calling for a Europe of solidarity. But I would also say that if we're to deal with issues like climate change, like environmental uh, issues, you cannot do it within national borders. You can only do it across national borders. The refugee crisis has to be dealt with internationally, not just nationally. So I do think working together, but mine isn't unconditional. Mine is a position that uh, I want to remain in Europe in order to be in a position to work with others to change it. Mr. Corbyn, so let's clarify a couple of things. 1975, you voted out. Yes. Yes. 1993, you voted against Maastricht. 2007, yes. Yes. Lisbon. Yes. So, and you think the EU is too beholden to corporate interests, there's a democratic deficit. Yes. So, do you really believe this, or have you had your head turned by meeting Francois Hollande at various Brussels summits that I've seen you at? <laughs> my head's not been turned by anything. Uh, my, head doesn't, my head doesn't get turned. Um, no, I'll just explain what I mean. Maastricht was about a free market Europe. That was Margaret Thatcher's vision of Europe, which was a free market Europe, free of all restrictions, free of working, protected working conditions, environmental protections, and all that. Lisbon was a step in the same direction. The social chapter, which was pressed for and negotiated for by a lot of socialist parties and trade unions, has helped to put into law something we've been demanding, trade unionists all across Europe, four weeks holiday maternity and paternity leave. It has made some difference to a lot of people's working conditions and the equality legislation that some of which we have is very important because of that. Okay, we're going to come on to some of that. There's a specific question along this line by Tom Greenstein. Tom. Hi, hi Joe. If you were to be elected Prime Minister in 2020, how would you fulfil your pledge to renationalise the railways amongst other sectors like energy and industry if EU competition laws prohibit you from doing that? At the moment, the fourth rail package is being negotiated in the European Parliament. This is the one which, if the right get their way, will uh, require member states to um, privatise rail services. We have a publicly owned rail system and a, private, a privatised system of um, the train operating companies, the actual services. Um, I'm strongly opposed to the fourth rail package. It's very unlikely to go through. I keep in daily contact almost with some of our MEPs who are opposing it. But as far as I'm concerned, if we're elected in 2020 or sooner as a Labour government on a clear manifesto commitment to bring our railways into public ownership, we will do it. And if that means an argument, if it means an argument, then we'll have that argument. But I want to head it off but now by saying that member states do have a right to have publicly owned railway systems. At the moment, the, the Dutch, the French and the German and Italian and Spanish systems are all almost totally or totally publicly owned. They are operating on our rail networks in Britain. So we do have a publicly owned rail system in Britain. The only problem is it's not the British public who own it. Now, Mr Corbyn, you did say in your Morning Star column in 2008 it's almost impossible for a government to take any industry into public ownership of its own free will because it would be accused of giving illegal state subsidies. It also applies to steel as well. How can you have the actual tools that you want <coughs> for your labour agenda while staying in the EU? The, the EU state, state aid rules are being challenged. They're being challenged by Germany and France and Italy at the moment over the steel crisis. And I would want to challenge those as well because I do think Europe as a whole has to react towards the dumping of underpriced, priced below production costs of Chinese steel on the European market and we have to be prepared, willing and able to invest in our own steel industry, which is actually a very highly productive industry, to maintain that manufacturing base for our economy. So for this agenda though, you're going to have to be elected Prime Minister and then persuade the likes of Angela Merkel and Viktor Orban round to your vision. It doesn't seem hugely likely. Well, I'll tell you this. When the French government decides what it wants to do on its agricultural policy, it does it. 
and the rest of Europe follows on behind. I just think the national governments have to be assertive on this and the state aid rules are open to a great deal of interpretation but as far as I'm concerned our agenda my agenda as leader of the Labour Party is public ownership of the railways, is an investment in manufacturing industry, and it is about the social Europe that I want to see. And being a bit more French, it seems, <coughs> anyway. Being a bit more friends with who? <laughs> with the EU. <laughs> I've got lots of friends in lots of countries. Okay, Daniel, Daniel, Ch Daniel, Daniel Chapeta. Here we Hi, go. Jeremy. Um, I've witnessed severe deprivation through my job as a student social worker. What is the case for voting to remain in an organisation that promotes policies such as TTIP, policies that will in the long term sustain inequalities in our society? TTIP is um, the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership and the idea behind TTIP is that it's fundamentally there is investor protection. So a big company investing in say Sweden or say Britain or Italy um, and a law is changed which would be seen as detrimental to that company, they can then sue the national government. So in effect it empowers national governments. The example in operation at the moment is NAFTA, North Atlantic Free Trade Association, which is extremely damaging to the people of Mexico and a great advantage to the big companies in the USA and very damaging to working class interests in the USA. TTIP is being very strongly opposed in the USA by some of the right who don't think the USA should ever sign a treaty in, with anybody because they just don't believe in treaties and many trade unions on the left who think it's damaged their working conditions and it's being opposed all across Europe. I think there's every chance it will never even see the light of day. That's one of the reasons why we have to press on very hard in, in opposition to it. I don't want to see the enfranchisement of um, global corporations at the expense of national democratic parliaments and I think the EU is wholly wrong in doing this negotiation but I do think working within Europe on a market in Europe in which our manufacturing goods from this country can be exported and sold in Europe and more than half our trade is with Europe is important and crucially I do believe that the environmental protections which would be a threat under threat with TTIP are very strong in Europe and should indeed be strengthened. You can't deal with pollution behind a national frontier. But Mr. But Mr. Corbyn, <clears throat> the uh, Strong Wind campaign says that the EU-US trade deal, which is what TTIP is, is one of the main reasons why they want to stay in. <clears throat> this is not coherent uh, across all of your coalition that wants to remain. My view is that TTIP as it stands is the enfranchisement of global corporations at the expense of democratic governments. That is why I've made a position very clear on why I'm opposed to it. And, and very you clear what I would want to do. Does it mean there are differences of opinion in Europe, in Europe and on Europe? Of course it does. Mine is a practical view that if we stay in the European Union we can fight against things. If we came out of the European Union the um, a government led by the main people that are leading the Leave campaign, they would sign a TTIP straight away with the USA if they could. Okay, so we've talked a bit about some of these issues. Does anyone want to come back on uh, this set of issues? This gentleman here? Yeah. I wanted to ask a question. Because this on, this, on this issue, yeah? Yeah, on this issue. Will voting to remain lead to privatisation of NHS? Oh. Voting to remain? Yeah. No, no, it won't because we've already uh, got a guarantee of exemption of, of the NHS on this. I think it is more likely that a vote to leave would do more damage to the NHS because of the economic consequences that go with it. But also there are 52,000 EU nationals working in our National Health Service helping to treat all of us and as far as I'm concerned the National Health Service as a human right free at the point of use is something I would absolutely defend to the end because I think it's the most civilized thing about this country. Okay, uh, Vedanta Kumar changing the subject. Where's Vedanta? Yeah. Hello Vedanta, there Hello. we go. Hey, um, the EU's response to the refugee crisis has been appalling. Um, it's failed the most fundamental test of any political organisation um, to protect basic human rights. Given this, um, why should we vote to stay in? Um, can we change it for the better? And if so, how? The refugee crisis is appalling and the human rights issues are very important. Uh, this country signed the European Convention on Human Rights after the Second World War and that in turn established the European Court of Human Rights. That is actually not an EU institution, it's a Council of Europe institution which is a predecessor coming together of a much wider group of countries. 
the EU has to many to a large extent incorporated the European Convention into its EU positions and in 1998 Britain passed its own Human Rights Act I indeed voted for it very proudly voted for it which incorporates into UK law all of that we leave the European Union we then have a problem of what we do about that er, er, those areas of human rights law I think we've treated human rights law very badly many of our media spend their whole time denigrating human rights law and saying it's a problem our right to free speech our right to express ourselves our right to be lesbian be gay be straight whatever you want to be is very very important on the refugee crisis I've been to Calais and I've been to Dunkirk. Indeed, we, we did an interview when we were there. I think you and I, I think, were both appalled by the conditions that we saw. And uh, I find the treatment of refugees by this country and by Europe deeply disturbing. We have now got more dis distressed and displaced people around the world than any point in recorded history. We're not going to solve that crisis with barbed wire, with surveillance, with CS gas. You're only going to solve it by humanity and a political solution in Syria. So the EU has given aid, has given support in that sense, but the member states have started to erect barriers to prevent the movement of refugees. I think Germany has probably done the best, other countries have done considerably worse. And my role, and I'm going to France next month at a meeting of socialist parties in France, I will be making a very strong plea on behalf of our party that every government across Europe has got to play its part in housing those refugees because the Syrian refugees are just like all of us in this room. They're fleeing from a war, looking for somewhere safe to go to. Surely there has to be humanitarian response, not the bigoted response of putting up a 32-sheet poster which says a group of desperate people are somehow or other a threat to us. No, they're not. They're no threat at all. The threat is the hatred that is put towards those people by those people that put up that poster. Well, we'll, we'll come back to Vedanta in a minute. Um, but... What makes you think that the European Union has got a handle on this? The aid group, the respected aid group, Médecins Sans Frontières, has just announced it will no longer take any money from a member of the EU, including Britain, in protest at the way Europe has responded to the refugee crisis with this special deal with Turkey. They've called it a shameful European response focused on deterrence rather than providing people with the assistance and protection they need. Why is it staying in the EU going to help? I challenged the, the, um, Turkey, the Turkey deal when it came up and I said to the Prime Minister at the time I thought the whole thing was questionably legal and indeed I think the treatment of the refugees is appalling uh, I want to be there to argue that Europe has to have a different response look if there was no European Union and instead you had 27 member states would there be any coordinated response or not probably not would there be any route out for those refugees probably not but you don't back so, the coordinated response that's that's come up the coordinated response is no, I, I support the coordinated response that gives support and aid. What I don't support is the coordinated response which has actually turned Greece into a transit camp for refugees, many of whom returned to Turkey. I've raised this matter with the Greek government. I don't blame the Greek government for this. I blame the um, consortium of European leaders that I don't think have done enough on this. But Anthony, do you want to come back in on this? Um, I completely I agree with what was, was said, actually. Um, yeah, well, who, does, who doesn't agree? Who's a bit, who's a bit more sceptical about it? Uh, gentleman, gentleman over here. What's your name, sir? Uh, Matthew. Matthew. Um, I don't think anyone's really got an issue with the Syrian refugees themselves. It's more a case of the people that would come across with them, because there's not adequate checks in place to check who's actually coming through with them. Well, uh, I've dealt with a very large number of refugee cases over many years as an MP and uh, human right, a member of the human rights groups in Parliament. I tell you, getting refugee status is very difficult and there are very detailed checks done on anyone applying for refugee status and I've been dealing with these cases ever since the 1970s when I was supporting refugees from Chile, many of whom have now gone back and oddly enough still, some of them still keep in touch with me. The idea that uh, you can just walk in a country and announce you're a refugee and get status is far, far, far from the reality of it. The numbers who actually get refused, sadly some of whom get deported or deported to a third country, is very great indeed. I think we should also reflect for a moment that um, somebody who's seeking asylum is a human like us, as I said, 
but also they're here to make a contribution. Many of our doctors, many of our scientists, many people that are making a huge contribution to this country came in as refugees. The iconic car, the Mini, was designed by Alexis Agonis, who was himself a refugee. A gentleman here wants to come in on the same issue, yeah? Uh, those detail checks What's your name? Sorry. Uh, Jordan. Jordan. Hi, Jordan. The detail checks you just outlined, do they, what about the people that are uh, being discovered in the back of lorries that we see on the news daily? Are they, you know, they're not going through checks and they're getting in. Who's not going to be checked, sorry? The refugees that are coming in on the back of lorries that we see on the news, so they're not getting through the extensive checks, they're just coming across. Well, at the point when they apply for asylum status, yes, they are. And um, I have met some people that have just arrived in this country from Afghanistan by a series of lorries because they had been uh, translators for the Western forces in Afghanistan, were no longer safe to live there, weren't allowed to leave or given advance entry to any Western country, so came in by an illegal route. Everything we do has consequences. And so, uh, yes, they are given those checks. And if we want to make ourselves safe, then you try and reduce the tension at the source. Hence, my very strong view that there should be much greater effort put into bringing about a political settlement in Syria and a political settlement in Libya. There's something strange that's going on at the moment. Hundreds of people have died trying to cross the Mediterranean or trying to cross the sea. Um, into Greece. Has it had headline coverage day after day after day? No. It's had minimal coverage. There are, it's had some coverage more lately, but this isn't, this isn't a new thing. This has gone on for several years. I just think we need to recognise the humanitarian disasters right on the shores of our continent. Okay, there's just one gentleman on this yes, issue here. Um, Can we get round to him? Um, I find it absolutely fascinating how you say the EU and Germany have done really well, which is especially Germany, yet yeah? it was Angela Merkel who made the worst policy I've ever by saying everyone can come, and that has caused people to think they're going to get a better life and they've risked going over the Mediterranean and they've been drowning as a, con or as a consequence of that really bad error, which I think is probably the worst I've ever seen since I've been alive. So. Think shock, shocking person. I think hers was a human response and a feeling that um, many people, particularly Jewish people from Germany, were denied a place of safety in the 1930s by the cold hearted attitudes of many other countries. And they died as a result. Quite rightly, we praise the kinder transport and those that got through. Absolutely. Tens of thousands of didn't, and they didn't, and they ended up dying in, in the concentration camps. I think Angela Merkel was actually trying to make a humanitarian response. She assumed. I mean, I've never met Angela Merkel. I've never had this discussion with her. I would look forward to doing it. I think behind her assumption was that the rest of Europe would be prepared to play its part and provide a haven for a proportion of those Syrian refugees. That started to happen, and then suddenly. The rise of the right in Germany, the rise of the right in other places stopped all that and we ended up with the quite frankly appalling situation we have. So, at so Mr time. Corbyn, you think both that there should be unlimited freedom of movement between in the EU context and also more refugees? I think there's we, not a great deal of public support for that, is there? No, I, I th what I'm saying on the refugees is deal with the problem at source because actually being a refugee isn't necessarily a solution to your problems. It might be a last resort because of the dangerous situation you're in, which okay. is why I keep repeating the point about the question of our arms sales to people, okay, the questions on, on of our foreign policy. So I think that's quite important. On the freedom of movement, if we're in one market, yes, there is going to be freedom of movement of labour as well as capital. My point is that working conditions are different across Europe. There are some basics, such as the holiday, such as the maternity and paternity leave, and those kind of working time directive. Those things are important. But we have a situation where some very greedy companies import their entire workforce from a low-paying economy, somewhere in Central Europe, bring them lock, stock and barrel to a higher-paying uh, country, Holland, France, Germany, Britain, and uh, pay them at the local rate. So the scandal of what's going on at um, 
at Shirebrook with um, Sports Direct is an example of all of that, which is why the proposal by um, the European Union Commission for a posting of workers directive, which would mean that any company employing people must pay the appropriate rate for the country concerned and respect local agreements such as the uh, construction disagreement, those things are quite important, and also ban the advertising of jobs in this country solely outside this country. Wouldn't so it be easier jobs are available, to, it be easier they should be leave? advertised locally to everybody here as well as anywhere else. Would it not be easier just to leave? No, it wouldn't be easy to leave because I think the problems then are economic um, uh, very greatly because the roughly half of our trade is with the European Union. A whole swathes of our manufacturing industry rely solely on exports to Europe. There are job consequences. Okay, well, Ryan's got a related question. Ryan Scott, Ryan's over there. Thank you, Ryan. Right, you're the leader of the party who traditionally supports the working class people. So how do you intend to help out people on the lowest wages who are potentially seeing their wage being driven down by the uncontrolled levels of migration from the EU? By ensuring that local wage rates are paid, that the minimum wage is respected, that the living wage becomes a reality. Ten pounds an hour seems to me the figure that we should be campaigning for. But also to ensure there is lower levels of disparity um, so that people don't necessarily feel so attracted to go and work elsewhere because they get better wages. Now, I think it's complicated, it's not easy, but there's also two million British people thereabouts, a million who live and others who work on shorter term contracts living in Europe and working in Europe. If we decide to leave, there is a problem about th those people as well because I guess many of us would know people that have gone to live in France or Spain or wherever else and are actually working and contributing to those societies as well. So I convince you, Ryan? Yeah, my question was um, people are prepared to come from Eastern European yeah. countries as, as an example and work longer hours, forgetting the working time directive or anything, yeah, work sure, longer sure. hours yeah. and sometimes harder than, say, British people would do. Now, I'm not saying that British people think that they are a step ahead, but companies know that they can employ labour from the EU for cheaper than British people will be prepared to work for. So that's where the underlying issue is, I believe, that companies know they can pay lower wages without the uncontrolled level of migration. Um, companies will be forced into paying a higher wage to attract British people to do the jobs. Exactly my point. Those companies are exploiting the migrant workers as well as the, uh, the people that are here. They're all suffering as a result of it because of the lack of regulation of what they do. Therefore, a um, higher minimum wage is important. It would end to stop that happening and much more control of the way that these companies behave. Now, I, I mentioned uh, Mike Ashley and, and Sports Direct. Uh, most of the people he employs, in fact probably more than three quarters of them, are on zero hours contracts. And so people are brought here under the false pretense they're going to get a steady job with a, a good income. In reality, they get a very low income on a zero hours contract. So one of my strong proposals is to join with the majority of other countries across Europe that have actually banned zero hours contracts and said anyone in work has to have a minimum number of hours and therefore a minimum income as a result of it. The people we should blame aren't the migrant workers, the people we should blame as the grotesque exploitation, which I'm sure you would agree with me on, yeah. of the, these companies and that the way that they, they treat people. So it's a question surely of our solidarity with those that are victims as well. Uh, Mr Corbyn, on this issue you have some strange bedfellows now. Uh, the Chancellor, George Osborne, told Sky News last week, it's the people on the lower incomes that will be hit first if there's a recession. Brexit is for the richest in our country. Do you agree with the Chancellor? It's a very odd statement coming from George Osborne. I, I confess it's the first I've heard of it. So, um, but in theory, can I reflect on that. Well, you, you may be able to reflect. <laughs> you may be able to reflect on that later. Let's go to. Well, anyone else want to come back on that issue of? Of my, there's a gentleman over here. If we can just bring the camera around over here. What's your uh, What's your name, sir? Nice no, Ben. Ben. Okay. Oh, cool, you're oh, an ben. internationalist. Uh, yeah. You're an internationalist, and um, I mean, I'm, 
I'm sure even you agree that it should be some controls on immigration. But personally, I'm not a, you know, a sort of shut-the-borders kind of guy. I think immigration is good for our country. But how can you defend a system whereby in the EU it's unlimited immigration, therefore outside we have to prevent people who are skilled from coming here? So how, what, you know, why should someone from outside the EU be turned down in favour of an unskilled worker from inside? Well, it isn't unlimited in either respect, actually. Uh, outside of the... But it is inside, because it's free movement. No, it's not, it's not completely restricted. I'll explain. Uh, outside the EU, it's certainly not restricted. It is, sorry, it certainly is restricted. And uh, it's quite difficult often to get family reunion. I have many constituents who are very upset about that. Within the EU, there is not immediate access to benefits. There isn't immediate um, uh, benefits of every kind, such as access to housing and things like that. And so people coming in um, uh, work here and contribute here. The vast majority of EU nationals that make their homes in Britain are actually working and paying tax and not drawing benefits. That's um, the, point. the point is, is that the, you're still turning down skilled people from outside in favour of less skilled people from inside. How is that fair? Well, a quick to answer. We've got to move on. Well, if you restrict movement of labour across Europe, then you're defeating the whole point of there being one market um, within Europe. Now, I make the point earlier to the uh, gentleman over there that there are more than a million British people working in other parts of Europe. So if we decided to leave and therefore stop people working here, we'd have a problem because we'd lose a very large number of people working in very crucial industries in this country. There would possibly be a retribution on the other side, and what would happen to those million British people um, living in Europe? Surely the important thing is to improve yeah. the working conditions and living standards across the whole continent, because at the moment there is a pretty big disparity between working conditions, living standards in the west of Europe and in Central Europe and the east. Surely that imbalance has to be addressed. Okay, Numbers of Polish people have come in and worked. In fact, actually many have gone back and have uh, helped to develop the economy there as well. Okay, we have so to move there is on. an economic benefit both ways. So Sorry, it's called Madeleine Rackage platt Where's Madeline? Hi, Madeline. <coughs> Hi, Jeremy. Uh, why should older people be deciding on something which is so important to younger people? And do you think that 16 and 17-year-olds should have been given the right to vote on this referendum? I, I do think the 16 and 17-year-olds should have been given the right to vote. And it's not only older people that are going to decide, it's everybody who's registered to vote is going to decide. I think what you're referring to is the general uh, generality that older people vote and younger people don't. Only half of young people voted in the last general election. Very sad. I hope we can get everybody voting, every young person voting. I want the voting age really re reduced to 16. I supported reducing it for 16 for this referendum, as indeed it was done for the Scottish referendum, because it is young people's future to decide what kind of relationships they have with the, West of, uh, with the rest of Europe, and that um, it's their future. Ma Madeline, wh why do you think young people aren't engaged when it is this EU referendum is their future? Um, I think younger people are probably, especially teenagers and 16 and 17 year olds, they're probably put off by the sort of butting of heads of all the, poli the leading politicians and sort of, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to watch uh, these sort of clownish figures like Boris Johnson sort of making, and Nigel Farage, like, you're, you're young, being very polite about Mr. Corbyn. Young people aren't really connected with them. <laughs> Yeah, I think the way politics is conducted so often is actually a total put-off. I mean, I personally don't do abuse of anybody because I think it's wrong and it's counterproductive. If you and I were having a difference of opinion on something, I called you something rude, you called me something rude, first exchange is quite funny. Second exchange, about half the audience would be listening. The third one, nobody would care and they wouldn't be interested in what either of us was saying. All they would see is two politicians hurling abuse at each other. And so I just think we've got to focus on the subject, focus on the issues, and I say to young people, try and engage. I do think political parties and polit politicians are often very bad at communicating with young people and assume that the methods that have been um, tried and tested of doorstep conversations and leaflets are not necessarily the way a lot of young people communicate. They do much more by social media and indeed I try to do as much as I can by social media. The, the Mayor of London has said the that this, London, this yes. current referendum campaign has been poisonous. Do you... It's been what? It's been poisonous. Well, he, was suffer he suffered a lot of poisonous abuse during the mayoral campaign himself, and I think a lot of it has been uh, very poisonous with sort of catastrophist theories on one side or, or both sides, and really people should sort of rationally think about it. I am not 
a lover of the European Union, I think is a rational decision. We should stay in order to try and improve it, but does that mean I change my views on the points that were raised on public ownership of railways and things like that? Absolutely not. But it means that I would want to be working with people across Europe on environmental protection, on public ownership issues, and I think we'd get a long way down the line like that. You're not a lover of the European Union. There we go. Brian, uh, last question from Brian Long. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, I was just wondering, will you shoulder some of the blame in the event of a Brexit? Will what? Will you shoulder some of the blame in the event of a Brexit? I'm not going to take blame for people's decision. There will be a decision made on Thursday. Obviously, I yes, hope sorry, it's... You're, you're Can I finish? Remain. No, I'm hoping there's going to be a Remain vote. Yeah. There may well be a Remain vote. There may well be a Leave vote. Whatever the result, that is the result of the referendum. We've got to work with it. You don't sound too keen on the EU with that no, answer. No, <laughs> whatever the result, we've got to work with it. And I would say to the EU, whatever the result, I want to see better working conditions across Europe. I want to see better environmental protections across Europe. We all suffer from these things. I want to see a trade policy that doesn't export pollution by importing goods that have been made in a deeply pollutive way. I want to see all of that. So I'll be pursuing exactly the same agenda on Friday morning that I've put to you tonight. So it's immaterial one way or the other? No, it's not immaterial yeah. because it's much harder if we leave. Okay. So you're definitely voting? Yes, Remain. I'll be there. Your brother, your brother thought maybe you wouldn't be, but you, we've got a confirmation. My brother there. has many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Corbyn. Uh, this is a tough audience, and even tougher uh, on a on a day like today. So thank we um, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you want to make a final statement. Thank you for inviting me along tonight, and thank you for the questions that have been put. It is an important decision. It's an important vote that's taking place this Thursday. I hope people will think about the kind of continent we want to live in and the kind of society we want to live in. We live in a world where there are humanitarian disasters. We live in a world where there are great dangers. There is also a world we could live in where we work much closer together with people, popular movements and ordinary people who think the way that we do, so that we can bring about more social justice across this continent. We can be an influence for better environmental protection and standards around the world. I've come to this conclusion after a lot of thought, a lot of process. My party has come to that conclusion after also a lot of thought, a lot of process. But above all, it's about the kind of democratic society in which we want to live, in which everyone's point of view is important and everyone is able to take part and contribute to that. And so I think tonight we've had an interesting exchange. It won't stop here. It will never stop because if we're determined to look after other people and create a fairer and more just world, we do it by working together, not by being individuals and certainly not by being abusive to each other or abusive to the most vulnerable and most desperate people who are plead pleading for our help at the present time. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Okay, we've, we've just got time for a little bit more. Anyone want to come back with one final point here? Just a gentleman here. One quick point. Oh, I had a question. Just go on. My question is, uh, we're in the middle of a housing crisis, and many economists say that actually being in Europe is propping up by housing prices because of flows of money coming into the UK. How will staying in Europe help us overcome the housing crisis? A zinger there. Chase down the tax avoiders and the tax havens. Some of them are in Europe, some of them are in the British... Virgin Islands and Cayman Islands, but secondly, challenge the British government on not building council housing, not regulating the private rented sector, not building houses for sale that are remotely affordable, and allowing the um, social cleansing of the centres of all of the great cities of this country. It's a UK responsibility, it's a British government responsibility. We can must and will conquer the housing crisis by building homes for people that need them rather than building them as investment opportunities to avoid tax. Okay, that's all we've got time for. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.